Right. Welcome once again, Adelina. It's always lovely to see you and, and your knowledge that you're giving us in the, in the medical profession and also indirectly to our patient community. Something that's quite dear to my heart is metabolic diseases. And in the medical world, that includes things like diabetes, it includes inflammation and heart disease. Now we know that heart disease is inflammation. Um, we talk about stealth infections, Lyme disease, and we talk about gut microbiome. We know that we coexist with 23 trillion bacteria. That's a huge amount. Um, and sometimes this Amazon rainforest goes out of sync and causes problems. So something that I'm not aware of, but a lot of conferences I've been around, that they always have a hygienist talking. Mm -hmm. and, and this is universal in all longevity medicine. So clearly the mouth is a very powerful area of both protection, but also mm -hmm. entry point of illness. Um, so could we elaborate on, first of all, diabetes? Um, can we diagnose diabetes through the mouth? Sometimes. Yeah. So one of the first signs is that I, I've always heard this when I was a student to look out for the pear drop smell. Yeah. Ketosis. Ketosis. Yeah. So, the, you know, there's been a few incidents where really? I was able to get to the patient and say, do you I think you should see your doctor? That's incredible. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Been able to. Yeah. Yeah. People through that. Yeah. Well, we know with diabetes, the insulin resistance is up and there's more sugar in the blood than there should be. Yeah. It's not in the cells, it's in the blood. Mm -hmm. How does this impact on gum disease? Does it make it worse? So, research uh, shows that if you have periodontal disease, you're more likely to have diabetes. Oh. If you have diabetes, you're more likely to have periodontal disease. Got it. So, cause and consequence. And also, if you think about it, it's about um, blood flow. Yeah. And with diabetes, that's compromised. It is, yes. Um, so there's less um, what we call the fighting cells, yes. fighting of the infection that is occurring yes. in your gums, yes. in your um, periodontal tissues. Yes. And so it's very important that uh, if I'm seeing a patient that has diabetes, that I reinforce how they should be maintaining the good oral hygiene, what I call home care every day. Because yes, when I see a patient, I will be doing my best at that visit. But essentially, it's what patient does every single day. Yes. Uh, not what I do every three or six months. And I always use the, you as an example. So I say, well, if you go and see Ash and he gives you the um, diabetes tablets and you don't take them, do you think we'll treat you? <laughs> They've been sad. <laughs> point. So it's about uh, the patient maintaining good oral hygiene at home every day. Yes, they need, they're need. they more vulnerable. Job, so it's, absolutely. Yeah. My job is to, in a way, um, help them achieve that okay. and monitor any changes yeah. and address seeing those changes uh, as it occurs. Um, because as I said, uh, diabetics, they're more prone to periodontal disease. That means that there will be uh, more dental pocketing, which is essentially spaces between the teeth and the gum that look like this. So yeah. if it looks like this, there's going to be more space for to, to, yeah. to get in yeah. and attack the bone and the structures that support in the teeth. Interesting. So, periodontal disease is made worse by diabetes, mm -hmm. um, and diabetes itself can cause yeah. the problem too. Mm -hmm. So, moving on to uh, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, inflammation in joints. We know in our world that inflammation is a consequence of immune dysfunction. Mm. Um, how does that show in the mouth? So if you're maintaining good oral health, you're less likely to have those conditions. And that is that if, if you have poor oral hygiene, you essentially have chronic infection. Uh, one of my colleagues, I, told me something that I found it quite fascinating at the time. This was quite a while ago, but 
also remember, if you have gum disease and if you were to lay down all the surfaces of the gums that are essentially infected, because it is an infection, it would be the same uh, area of two palms of your hand. Oh, good. So, no, so then I say to my patients, imagine having this area and the skin is peeled away and is open to the environment. Goodness. Because that's essentially what has happened. What is happening. That's a good analogy. I'm not quite sure if that's that's you know, if that would apply to everyone, but the point when you put that uh, across like that is quite quite yes. isn't it? Well, what I'm interested in is the fact that you can do something in the mouth. You can yeah. access the mouth. Yeah. The same thing happens in the rest of the gut too. Mm -hmm. There's a paper published in 2020 by a paediatric gastroenterologist who shows that when you have gaps in your gut holes effectively, bacteria get in, yeah. cause toxins and lead to autoimmune diseases like arthritis. Yeah. So that's been proven and he's actually said that that is the cause of most autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So logic states the mouth is also a, a possible entry point, but you can do something in the mouth. You can't floss your gut, or you can try, but it's not so easy. But here, you can actually physically do something about it. I find it so amazing because let's just think for a moment. Imagine if that all we have to tell patients is that to look after your overall health, all you need to do is floss and brush correctly. And see your hygiene. Yes. I mean, well, simple many, things are. Yeah. Are the, are the secret to most things, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I guess if you think back a few years ago when uh, it was found that high cholesterol was bad for your health and for your heart. And at the time, it was as easy as tell a patient, well, let's cut down in certain foods and that will improve your health. Obviously, we now find out that it needs a little bit more. It also needs exercise, it needs cutting down uh, cigarettes and you know certain aspects uh, in your diet and yeah. social life of it to, to ensure it doesn't go that down that way. But I feel that at least with gum disease, it doesn't actually take that much to reverse uh, yeah. gingivitis. Yes. In fact, you can do it to yourself yeah. within five days. And, and, and people often say, oh, but I don't have the time to floss. Then I go, okay, then let's do this. I would like you to do it once a day, but very well. Because if you think about it, it takes 48 hours for plaque to mature and cause disease. The whole point of asking, well, recommend a patient to brush morning and night, twice a day, is because most people, they on, an av on average spend 30 seconds brushing their teeth. Yeah. So essentially by asking them to do it twice a day, we're increasing that by one minute, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, out of the, yeah. it should be two minutes yeah. um, each time. Yeah. But at least we've increased it yeah. by one minute. Yeah. Well, I think it's all about context. I think, uh, again, if people focus on this and see it as important, they'll yeah. realise it's not that time consuming. Yeah. But it's habits, isn't it? Because yeah. you don't feel pain, you don't feel anything no. you can get on. No. We take our teeth for granted, don't we? Until they cause pain or we lose them. And another misconception is that flossing causes gum disease. Right. Because yeah. people feel that they, they haven't flossed for a while and I can see someone smiling. <laughs> um, they haven't flossed for a while, and what happens is that obviously there will be inflammation there. So if you're gonna apply a floss into gingival tissues that are inflamed, of course it's gonna bleed. Yes. But it's a catch-22. If you don't address that initial bleeding, and you stop doing it because you feel it's bleeding, so you don't want to do it, you're never going to yeah, get rid of it. Out. So you must persevere to the point that you Stop. got rid of bacteria that is causing the inflammation in the yeah. first place. Yes, and of course, bleeding is not always bad. It's a way of healing. Yeah. So we, it's, a, it's the way of the body sending blood flow to an area mm. and oxygen. So we talked about diabetes. We talked a little bit about the gut and how it mimics the mouth to some extent. Mm -hmm. 
we talked about the risk of autoimmune disease and arthritis. When I was in medical school, one of the big things we were worried about was something called subacute bacterial endocarditis. And if people had artificial valves, they had to take antibiotics even before they saw a dentist because any infection going to these valves could cause fatal outcomes. <laughs> we don't see that as much now. Is that because people are looking after their teeth better, because of all hygienists? But there is still a link between heart infection and valvular infection and mouths. I mean, I remember when I was a dental uh, nurse quite a while ago, during my training at the London Hospital, that we would often see patients that were scheduled for open heart surgery. And it's quite sad. They used to have to come in for, clear, for full mouth clearance before the Ooh. surgery. So you had to remove their teeth before you did surgery? Mostly um, teeth that had Goodness. very poor prognosis. And I always found that sad. And I guess that's what later on, during my dental uh, hygiene training, that I was so keen to do the literature review on the um, gum disease and stem disease link. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. No. I think it's because obviously uh, people have, well, they feel that they're a bit better in yeah. maintaining their oral hygiene and also I think cardiologists as a whole they are aware obviously the implications of chronic inflammation in the mouth which essentially is what cause often the problems with the heart yeah so yeah. they're now very keen that to send um, people to have to hygienists in fact uh, I saw a lady um, last week and one of the first things that um, I asked as soon as they come to my room is as in, hello my name is Isolina I'm one the hygienist here and I asked has anything changed in medical history and this lady in particular turned around and said yes I just had uh, open heart surgery mm -hmm. and, ah okay and uh, we had to reschedule her appointment because she had um, open heart surgery not that long ago because there's another thing as well, is that what most people don't realize is that if, um, when you come to see a hygienist, and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but if there's such a huge bacterial load in your mouth, it can actually induce to renew. Mm. Yeah, so, sepsis even. So, uh, with that lady in particular, I felt because it hadn't been long since she had the, the surgery, we actually postponed the treatment. Yeah. And I, I sent a letter to the hair cardiologist inquiring whether she should be on an um, antibiotic prophylactic uh, course. Um, but yeah, I think things like that, mm. it's, it's thing the community as a whole, the, the health community as a whole, we are sharing information, we are being more proactive in ensuring that we're giving the best care yes. to patients. Good, well that, thank you. I mean, the other thing is we don't see much rheumatic fever now. We know mm. rheumatic fever comes from strep infection yes. in, the, in the oral ENT cavity. Mm. So we're making progress in some ways. So, mm. And I'm sure that good dental hygiene and regular visits mm. has got a lot to contribute to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our next episode is about children and oral hygiene.